Hello everyone and welcome to another recitation video. Uh, in this video, I'm going to solve a few problems from the topic of entropy. So let's start with the first problem. We have an insulated rigid tank that contains 2 kg of saturated mixture of water at 100 kPa. And uh, initially, 3 quarters of the mass is in the liquid phase. So uh, from the get-go, we know the quality of the mixture. An electric resistance heater is now turned on and it's kept on until the liquid in the tank vaporizes. Determine the change of entropy of the steam during this process. So what we have is a tank like this. We also have a resistant heater inside. Now we know that two kilograms of water uh, saturated mixture of water initially is contained in this tank. It is rigid and it is uh, insulated. So we know that initially pressure of the mixture is 100 kilopascals. We also know that the quality initially, because the problem specifically says that three quarters of the mass is in the liquid phase, it means that only one quarter of it is in vapor phase. So quality is one fourth. What do we know about the final state? At the final state, we don't know anything about the pressure, but we know that the entire liquid is vaporized. We turn off the process the moment that the entire liquid vaporizes. That means we are dealing with saturated vapor and because the volume of the tank uh, does not change it's a rigid tank we know that the second volume is equal to the initial volume and because the mass is not changing we can conclude that the specific volume two is equal to a specific volume one now these are the things that we can get from the problem definition now, we want to find the change of entropy of this steam uh, during this process. So, let's check the tables. Now, because the problem is in saturated mixture, I'll go to the saturated tables. I need to find the specific volume initially. So, specific volume of saturated liquid is needed. Specific volume of Saturated steam at 100 kPa is also needed. Both of them are in meters cubed per kilogram. I also need the entropy of saturated liquid and S of Fg, the difference between the saturated, uh, the entropy of saturated vapor and the entropy of saturated liquid. Both of entropies are in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, now from these numbers, I can start to work towards the specific volume. So specific volume one is going to be one minus quality one times specific volume of saturated liquid plus quality one times specific volume of saturated vapor. Now plug in numbers from the tables, the numbers that we have, and knowing that the X1 is one fourth, I get specific volume one is 0 0.423.0725 meters cube per kilogram. I mean, I'm just writing all the digits that my calculator is giving me, so you don't have to go up with that many digits. Okay, I can do the same calculations to find the entropy at state 1. So S1 is going to be S of F plus X1 S of FG. 
again, plug in the numbers that we have from the tables, I get S1, or entropy, uh, initially, is 2.81685 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. All right, so I have both the specific volume and entropy at the initial state. Okay, now at the final state, I know that specific volume 2 is equal to specific volume 1, which is equal to 0.4243, right? I also know that I'm dealing with a saturated vapor. This is at 2. So from these two, I know what I need to do. I need to go and check the tables. I need to go check the tables for saturated vapors that have VFG equal to this number. So what VFG is equal to VF2? Uh, and that will give me the state. So if you check that, you will see that you don't get the, final, the exact number in the tables. So you need to do an interpolation. I noticed that my V of 2 is larger than V of G at 450 kilopascals and smaller than V of G at 400 kilopascals. So I need to interpolate between these two pressures. But I am more interested than the entropy at the second state. So I am going to do my interpolation using the specific volumes and the entropies of these two pressures. Now, if I do that, I'm not going to do the uh, linear interpolation here. There is another video that I've done. A few examples of linear interpolation. Uh, I'll put a link to, the, uh, to that video, so make sure to check it out if you're not familiar with the concept of linear interpolation. Now, if you do the linear interpolation, you get that S2 is 6.8645 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now that I have both S1 and S2, I can find the change of entropy of steam. Delta capital S is mass times S2 minus S1. That is 2 times 6.8645. 86.45 minus 2.8168. That is 8.0953 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is uh, Final answer for the change of entropy of the steam during this process. Okay, problem two. We have again a rigid tank that is divided into two equal parts by a partition. One part of the tank contains 1.5 kilograms of compressed liquid water at 300 kilopascals and 60 degrees Celsius, and the other half is evacuated, is empty. The partition is removed and the water expands to fill the tank, the entire tank. If the final pressure inside the tank is 15 kilopascals, determine the entropy change of water during this process. So we have this tank. We have a partition in the middle. 1.5 kilogram is here. And the volumes are the same. So volume 1 here, volume 1 here. So what do we know? We know that initially we have water, compressed liquid water, at 300 kilopascals and 60 degrees Celsius. We know that at the final state, pressure is 15 kilopascals. And what else do we know? We know that the final volume is twice the initial volume. Mass is the same, so I can say specific volume 2 
is twice the specific volume one. Okay, so let's check the tables. Now we are dealing with a compressed liquid. So in order to read the properties uh, of this compressed liquid, we are going to check the tables for saturated water at 60 degrees Celsius. So specific volume one is the specific volume of saturated liquid at 60 degrees Celsius, which is 0 0.001017 meters cubed per kilogram. And uh, entropy is also the entropy of saturated liquid at 60 degrees, which from the table is 0.8313. Per kilogram Kelvin. for state two i know that specific volume two is twice the specific volume one so that means that specific volume two is zero point zero zero two zero thirty four meters cube per kilogram now i'm gonna check this number with the v of f and v of g at 15 kilopascals. Now, by checking the tables, I get that V2 is greater than the specific volume at of saturated liquid at 15 kilopascals, and it's smaller than V of G at 15 kilopascals. So, it means that uh, the final state is a saturated mixture. All right. Now, my next step is to find the quality of this mixture. So quality, final state, is specific volume 2 minus specific volume of saturated liquid at 15 kilopascals over specific volume of saturated vapor minus specific volume of saturated liquid. Now, plug in numbers from the tables, I get 0 0.00234 minus 0 0.001014 over 10.02 minus 0 0.001014. Doing the math, I get that quality 2 is actually a very small number, but it is something nonetheless. 1.018 times 10 to minus 4. This is my uh, second state quality. Now, using this number, I can find the entropy of a second state. Okay, so S2 is going to be S of F plus X2 s of f g now s f and s of f g are uh, numbers that you need to read from tables for 15 kilopascals it is 0 0.7549 plus x2 i know it's 1.018 and minus 4 times 7.2522 this gives me point 75.587 kilojoules kilogram Kelvin. Finally, I can say the change of entropy is mass times S2 minus S1, which for this problem is 1.5 kilograms of water times S2 is 0.7558 minus. S1 is 8313, which gives us minus 0 0.113 kilojoules per kilo. So our change of entropy for this scenario is negative, meaning that our system throughout this process is probably uh, losing heat because 
the only way that entropy decreases is through losing heat. Okay, problem three. We have an insulated piston and cylinder device that contains 0 0.05 meters cube of saturated R138A uh, vapor at 0.8 megapascals of pressure. The refrigerant is now allowed to expand in a reversible manner until the pressure drops to 0.4. We are asked to find a final temperature and the work done by the refrigerant. So initially, we have saturated vapor. Pressure is known. Pressure is 0.8 megapascals. And we also know the volume. What do we know about the final state? The final state, we know that we are dealing with pressure of 0.4 megapascals. We also know that problem says that the piston and cylinder is insulated. It also says that the expansion process is reversible. Now, any reversible adiabatic process is an isentropic process. We know it's adiabatic because the piston and cylinder is insulated. We know it's reversible because the problem explicitly says so. So we are dealing with an isentropic process. It means that the process is ideal and so change of entropy is zero. S2 is equal to S1. So this is the other known factor about state two. S2 is equal to S1. So let's start with the tables. At the initial state, I'm going to check the tables for the pressure of 0.8 megapascal and saturated vapor. I get S1 is equal to S of G is equal to 0 0.91835 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin and I'm going to need the internal energy later because we want to find uh, the work so I'm just going to read it right now internal energy u1 is u of g is 246.79 kilojoules per kilogram I can also read the specific volume as well I have the initial volume. If I know the specific volume, initial specific volume, then I can use these two pieces of information to find the mass of my system. So specific volume one is a specific volume of saturated vapor. It is going to be 0 0.025621 meters cubed per kilogram. Okay, so I got most of the things that I need. So let's check with the second state. So S2 is equal to S1 is equal to 0.91835, right? I want to know what is the state of my system at the second state. So I'm going to check this S with S of F and S of G at 0.4 megapascal. So if I do that, I'll get that S2 is between S of F and S of G at 0.4 megapascals. This means that I am dealing with a saturation mixture. Okay, so my next step is finding the quality at the final state. So quality is S2 minus SF over S of F G at 0.4 megapascals. Read the numbers from the tables and you get 0.9135 minus point 
over 0 0.67929, which gives us 0.98. Now, before we move on, just by knowing that we are dealing with a saturated mixture, I can answer part A. We know that in a saturated mixture, T is a function of pressure. So we are looking at the saturated temperature at 0.4 megapascals. That is 8.91 degrees Celsius. Now let's continue with part B. I need to find the internal energy at the final state. In order to do that, I need to use U2 is equal to U of F plus X2 U of F G. I have to read U of F and U of F G from the tables for the pressure of 0.4 megapascals. And plug in the numbers, doing the calculations, I get that U2, internal energy at the final states, is 231.641 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, uh, I am going to post the link to um, tables for both steam and refrigerant 134A uh, down in the description below. In this video, I'm not really focusing and I'm not going into detail of how to read the tables. I have plenty of videos uh, where I solve problems in detail, show you how to read the tables. Um, make sure to check them out if you have problem reading the tables. But here I'm just assuming that everyone is comfortable with reading uh, the tables, the property tables. So I have you two. Now I can proceed to find the boundary work. Okay, so for part B, I still need to find the mass of my system in order to find the boundary work. So let's start with that. Mass is going to be volume 1 over specific volume 1. Now, volume 1, problem says, I have a volume of 0 0.05 meters cubed. And a specific volume 1 is 0 0.2. Point two five six two one. If I do the math, I will get that mass is one point ninety five kilogram. I found the mass as well. Now we can continue to first law of thermodynamics. We know that Q net minus W net is equal to change of internal energy, which is m delta small w. Now in this problem, we are dealing with an insulated uh, device. So q is going to be zero. There are no other works but boundary work. So we are dealing with boundary work alone. I'm going to put the b here. There are no other type of works involved. And yeah, we have everything. So let's proceed minus W boundary is 1.95 times U2 minus U1. U2 is 231.641 minus U1, 246.79. Doing the math, I get that boundary work is 29 0.54 kilojoules. Problem four. We have a rigid tank containing five kilograms of saturated vapor steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, we let the steam cool down to ambient temperature of 25 degrees. We are asked to first show the process on a TV diagram and then find the entropy change for the steam and then find the total entropy change, or S-gen, for both the steam and the surroundings. Okay, so let's start with part A. If this is a TV diagram, 
this in T, this in V. What we have is a process that is happening inside a rigid tank. Now, a rigid tank means that the volume is not changing. So whatever our volume is, it's not changing throughout the process. So this is 100 degrees. This is 25 degrees. This is our process. Now for part B, we are asked to find the entropy change of the steam. So let's first see what we have at state 1 and state 2. At state 1, we know that we are dealing with saturated vapor. Right, so specific volume one is equal to specific volume of saturated vapor at 100 degrees Celsius, which is 1.672 meters cube per kilogram. We also know the entropy S1 is SFG at the same temperature which is from the table 7.3542 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, what do we know about the final state? We know that at the final state, as I mentioned earlier, the volume has not changed. So, specific volume two is again equal to specific volume one, which is one point. 67.2 meters cube kilograms. This time, however, the temperature is 25 degrees. So we are going to check the tables for 25 degrees Celsius. You will see that our specific volume is between saturated liquid and saturated vapor at 25 degrees Celsius. So we need to find quality. X2 is V2 minus V of F or V of G minus V of F at 25 degrees Celsius. So read the numbers from the tables. Get 1.672 minus 001003 over 43.34 minus 0 0.001003, which gives us x2 is 0 0.0385. So this is the quality. And using this quality, I can find entropy at the final state. So entropy at the final state is S of F plus x2 s of fg s of f and s of fg should be read from the table for 25 degrees celsius now let's plug in numbers 0.3672 plus 0.0385 times 8.1895 do the math and you get that s2 is 0.6825 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now we need to find the actual change of entropy. Delta S, capital letter S, is mass times S2 minus S1. So I can say delta S is 5 kilograms times S2. 0.6825 minus 7.3542. That is minus 33.359 kilojoules per Kelvin. Now for part C, we are asked to find uh, the total entropy change of both the steam and the surroundings. In order to find the uh, um, entropy change of the surroundings, we need to find the amount of heat transferred between uh, the system and the surroundings. First law of thermodynamics says Q minus W is M delta U. 
we are looking for Q. This is a rigid tank, so boundaries are not moving, and we don't have any other form of work, so W is dropped, and we are left with Q is M delta U. Now, we need to find U2 and U1. U1 is U of G at 100 degrees. So read it from the tables, 193.54 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so Q, the amount of heat transfer, is 5 kilograms times 193.54 minus 2,506, you will get Q is minus 11562.3 6, kilojoules. Now, the minus sign means that the system is losing the heat. So the surroundings is actually gaining the heat. So I can say delta S capital for both the system and the surroundings is the delta S of the steam plus U over T0 for the surroundings. Now delta S for the steam, we already know it's minus 33.359. Uh, the entropy of the surroundings is 115.62.3. Over the temperature of the surroundings, 25 degrees Celsius, we need to plug the Kelvin number here. So 25 degrees Celsius is 298 degrees Kelvin. You get 5.44 kilojoules per Kelvin. So this means that although our system, the steam, is losing heat and uh, the entropy is decreasing when you look at the bigger picture when you look at the system plus its surroundings the entropy through this process has been increasing problem five we have a 50 kilogram iron block and a 20 kilogram copper block um, both of them are initially at 80 degrees celsius we're dropping them into a lake which is sitting at 15 degrees celsius we are asked to find a total entropy change when the thermal equilibrium is achieved. Now, thermal equilibrium achieves when both the iron and copper blocks reach the temperature of the lake, because we're talking about the lake. Now, putting two blocks of iron and copper, no matter the mass, is not going to change the temperature of an entire lake. So, it is kind of obvious that the equilibrium temperature will be the temperature of the lake. Now, let's see what we know. We know that for solids and liquids, change of entropy is specific uh, heat of the solid or the liquid, natural log of T2 over T1. Now, this is the equation that we have. The other piece of information that we have is that the specific heat for iron is 0.45 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and specific heat for copper is 0.387 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay. So with these two pieces of information in mind, I can find the delta S for either of them. So for iron, delta capital S is going to be mass of the iron times C of iron, natural log of T2 over T1 for the iron. This gives me 50 kilograms times 0.45 times natural log of, now temperatures need to be in Kelvin. T2 is 15 degrees Celsius, that is 288 Kelvin. T1 is uh, 80 degrees Celsius, that is 353 Kelvin. You get that delta S of iron 
is minus 4.579 kilojoules per Kelvin. Now for copper, I have delta S is mass of the copper, C of the copper, natural log of T2 over T1 again. Now 20 kilograms of copper times 0.387 times natural log of the same numbers, 288 over 353. And you get delta S for the copper is minus 1.571 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, so we got the change of entropy for both the solids. Now we need to find the change of entropy for the lake. Lake in this problem is the surroundings. Now change of entropy for the surroundings, we know it is the heat transfer between the system and the surroundings divided by the temperature of the surroundings. So I need to find the total heat transfer between iron and copper and the lake. So let's start with the Q between the iron and water. So I'm going to show it with Q of iron. I know that it is mass of the iron, C of the iron, delta T of the iron. The amount of heat that the iron releases is equal to its mass times the specific heat times its temperature change. 50 kilograms times 0.45 times delta T. We are going from 80 to 15. That is 65 degrees change. We are looking at 1,462.5 kilojoules of energy. Same goes for the copper. Q of copper is equal to the mass of the copper, specific heat of the copper, delta T. Again, 20 kilograms times 0.387 times 65. We are looking at 501.8 kilojoules. So the total heat transfer between the solids and the lake I'm going to show it with Q, is 1,964.3 kilojoules. Now I can use this number to find the delta S total. So delta S is going to be the delta S of iron plus delta S of copper plus the delta S of the surroundings which we show it using Q total over the temperature of the surroundings. So if you plug in numbers, I have minus 4.579 minus 1.571 plus 1,964.3 over the temperature of the lake in Kelvin, that is 288. If I do the calculations, I get that the total change of entropy, including both iron, copper, and the lake, is going to be 0.67 kilojoules per Kelvin. All right, problem six. We have a compressor that is consuming 5 kilowatts of power and compresses air from 100 kilopascals to 600 kilopascals. The temperature also changes during the process from 17 degrees Celsius to 167 degrees Celsius. The mass flow rate is given 1.6 kilograms per minute. And we know that this compressor is not ideal, it's not adiabatic. And some heat transfer is uh, happening between the compressor and the surroundings. We are asked to find the rate of entropy change of air during this process. So first things first, we need to first change the m dot from 1.6 kilograms per minute to something kilogram per second. So in order to do that, I'm going to multiply this by 
one minute over 60 seconds. Now, if I do that, I get that M dot is 0.27 kilograms per second. Now, this is a unit that we are comfortable working with. Now, for ideal gases, the change of entropy is Cp natural log of T2 over T1 minus gas constant R natural log of P2 over P1. So all the information we need are given in the problem. We know that at state one, at the entrance of the compressor, we are we are dealing with air at 17 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals of pressure. And at the exit of the compressor, we are dealing with air at 167 degrees Celsius and 600 kilopascals. Now, remember, we need to change the temperatures to Kelvin. S dot is going to be M dot delta S, which is 0.27 times Cp of air is 1.005 natural log of T2 over T1. Changing the temperatures to Kelvin, I have 440 degrees over 290 degrees minus the gas constant for air is 0.287 natural log of 600 over 100. Now if we do the math we get that S dot is minus 0 0.00254 kilowatts per kilo. Okay, problem seven. We have a container filled with 45 kilograms of liquid water at 95 degrees Celsius. This container is placed in a well-sealed, well-insulated 90 meters cube room that is initially at 12 degrees Celsius. When the thermal equilibrium is achieved, we are asked to find the equilibrium temperature, the amount of heat transfer between water and air, and the entropy generation. Let's start with part A, the final equilibrium temperature. First law of thermodynamics is our friend here. We know that Q minus W is equal to the change of internal energy. Now in this problem, our system is the air and the water inside the container together. So we have water here and we have air inside the room. Now both air and water is our system. The boundaries of the system is the walls of this room which is well sealed and well insulated if you look at the problem this way then there is no q involved because the room is insulated there is no work involved because it's a rigid room the boundaries are not uh, moving and there are no other form of works involved so q and w both are zero delta u is the mass of water c of water Delta T of water plus mass of air, C of air, delta T of air. Now, C of air, air is a gas. Here we are dealing with a process that is happening in a constant volume room. So C at the constant volume. Now, if we plug in numbers, I know that I have 45 kilograms of water. C of water is 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram. And delta T of water is the final temperature we don't know minus the initial temperature 95 plus the initial mass of air we don't know. C of air at constant volume is 0.718 and the same temperature is T2 minus the initial temperature 12. This is going to be zero. Now here we have two unknowns, T2 and the mass of air. What can we do about the mass of air? Here is where the ideal gas equation comes into the picture. Now the ideal gas equation is P volume is equal to mass, gas constant, absolute temperature of the gas. Now using this equation, I get that the mass is T volume over RT. 
plug-in numbers I get, assuming that the air is atmospheric, is 101.3 kilopascals times the volume of the room, it is 90 meters cube. I am neglecting the volume occupied by the water container. Over gas constant for air is 0.287, and the absolute temperature, 12 degrees Celsius in Kelvin, is 285. Doing the math, I get M is 11.5 kilograms. So 11.5 kilograms of air is inside this room. Now I can use this information with this equation to find T2. So I get 45 times 4.2 times T2 minus 95 plus 11.5 times 0.718 times T2 minus 12 is 0. Do the math you get that T2 is 70.3 degrees Celsius. So this is part A. I found the equilibrium temperature. Now for part B, we are asked to find the amount of heat transfer between the water and the air. Now if I find the heat, the heat that the water is losing, that is equal to the amount of heat that the air is receiving. So that, that would be the heat transfer the amount of heat transfer between these two mediums. So, Q of water is 45 times 4.2 times 70.3 minus 95, which gives us minus 46.68.3. So, water is losing 4,670 kilojoules of energy to air. For part C, we are asked to find the entropy generation. Now, delta S is going to be the delta S of water plus the delta S of air. Now, because the system is insulated, there is no heat transfer with the surroundings outside the room, so we don't need to take that into account. So delta S of water, water is a liquid, will be mass of water, CO water, natural log of T2 over T1 for water. Delta S of air, air is ideal gas, so we have mass of air times CV, natural log of T2 over T1 of air plus R, natural log of volume 2 over volume 1. Now, we are working in, uh, with a problem that the room has solid walls and the volume is not changing. So, natural log of V2 over V1 for air is going to be natural log of 1. It's going to be 0. That term drops. We get delta S. Mass of water was 45 times 4.2 natural log of T2 is 70.3 degrees Celsius. We need to change it to Kelvin. That is 343.3 Kelvin over T1, 95 degrees, 368 degrees Kelvin. Plus... Mass of air was 11.5 times CV of air is 0.718. Natural log of T2, again, 343.3 Kelvin. Over T1 of air, it was 12 degrees Celsius. That is 285 Kelvin. Do the math, and you get that delta S is 1.76 kilojoules per kelvin. Okay, problem eight. We have a pump that is consuming 25 kilowatts uh, worth of power. If water enters at 100 kilopascals pressure, 
and a mass flow rate of five kilograms per second, what is the highest pressure that it can exit the pump with? If we want to achieve highest pressure from a single uh, pump, this pump needs to be ideal, meaning that there are no heat transfers with the surroundings, so no energy is lost through the heat transfer, and also there are no irreversibilities or you know frictions and stuff in the in the in the pumping process. This means that we are dealing with an reversible adiabatic pump, which is isentropic. Now isentropic means delta S is zero. For a liquid, that means C natural log of T2 over T1 is zero, meaning T2 is equal to T1. So water goes through the pump without any change in temperature. Now we can use the first law of thermodynamics. I know that first law says Q dot net minus W dot net is equal to for a pump problem, steady flow problem, is M dot delta H. H2 minus H1. Now I know that enthalpy by definition is U2 plus E2 over rho minus U1 minus P1 over rho. Now enthalpy by definition is internal energy plus the flow work. Flow work is pressure times a specific volume or pressure over density because a specific volume is one over density. Now, because the temperature does not change between states one and two, I can say, I can conclude that the internal energy does not change either. So U1 is equal to U2. So these two will cancel each other. We assume that there are no heat transfers involved. So Q dot is also going to be zero. Now we know that pump is consuming 25 kilowatts of power. So this equation is reduced to 25 is equal to m dot is five kilograms per second. Density of water, the problem says you can take it as a thousand. P2, we do not know, minus P1, 100 kilopascals. Doing the math, you get P2 is 5,100 kilopascals. Now, the reason that minus W dot uh, turned to positive 25 is that W dot net is W dot out minus W dot in. Now, we are working with a pump that has an input of W dot. So W dot net is minus 25 kilowatts, right? Here in the first law, we have a minus sign behind the W dot. So this minus sign will cancel this minus sign and we are end up with a positive 25. All right, problem nine. We have refrigerant 134A. It goes through an adiabatic compressor. It enters the compressor as saturated vapor and exits at 1.2 megapascals of pressure. If the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 80%, we are asked to find the temperature at the exit and the power input. So what do we know? First, we know that at the entrance, we are dealing with pressure of 120 kilopascals. We also know that the volumetric flow rate is given. Volumetric flow rate is 0.3 meters cube per second. And we know that the final state at the exit of the compressor, we have pressure to 1.2 megapascals. And yeah, that's all we know. We also know that the efficiency 
isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 80%. Let's start with that. Isentropic efficiency of a compressor is defined as the work input of an ideal compressor or an isentropic compressor over the work input of the actual compressor. Neglecting the change of potential and kinetic energies, and because we are told that we are dealing with an adiabatic compressor, I know that the work isentropic for a compressor is H2 isentropic minus H1 over H2 actual minus H1. To get a better understanding, we are talking about a compressor like this. This is the entrance and this is the exit. Now, the entrance, we are okay with that. We know it's 120 kilopascal. The exits, there are two scenarios. First scenario is the actual one, the one that this problem is running. This compressor is running. We show that with 2 slash A. The second scenario is what would have happened if we were dealing with an ideal isentropic compressor? The exit of that compressor would be different with uh, the compressor that we currently have. We show that with H2 slash S. So I know that the efficiency is 80%. I need to find all the other terms. So let's start with H1. So at 1, I know that I am dealing with saturated vapor. So I'm going to check the tables and read that H1 is H of G at the pressure of 120 kilopascals, which is 236.97 kilojoules per kilogram. So I found H1. Now I need to find H2 isentropic. So in order to find H2 isentropic, I'm going to assume that the process was indeed isentropic, meaning that S2 is equal to S1. So S2 is equal to S of G at 120 kilopascals, which again from the tables is 0.94779 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, I know that the pressure at the second state is given 1.2 megapascals. So I'm going to check my S2 with that pressure into the tables. So check tables. And I will get that my S2 is greater than the S of G at 1.2 megapascals, meaning that I'm dealing with a superheated steam, I'm sorry, superheated vapor at state two. So we go and check the superheated tables. The exact number for S2 is not given in the tables. So we have to interpolate. If you do that, you get H2S is 285.18 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, now I have H1, I have H2S, and I have the efficiency. The only unknown is H2 actual. So let's find it out. 0.8 is equal to H2S, 285.18, minus H1, 236.97, over the unknown H2 actual, minus... 236.97. Do the math and you will get H2 actual is 297.232 kilojoules per kilogram. So I found the actual enthalpy at the exit of my compressor. Now I can use the enthalpy that I found with the pressure of 1.2 megapascals to find the exit temperature. So let's do that. Okay, I am going to check the tables and you would see that H2 actual is greater than H of G at the pressure of 1.2 megapascals. 
So again, we are dealing with superheated vapor. So I go and check the superheated tables. Again, the exact number that I have for H2 actual is not given in the tables. But I noticed that my H2 actual is between the H of 60 degrees and the H of 70 degrees Celsius. So I need to interpolate. Doing that, I get that T2 is 66.92 degrees Celsius. So this is part A. We found the temperature at the exit. Okay, for part B, we are asked to find the power input. Now, from first law of thermodynamics, I know that the power input of a compressor is m dot um, h2 actual minus h1. Now, m dot is unknown. What we know is the volumetric flow rate at the entrance. Now, in order to change the volumetric flow rate to m dot, I need to know the specific volume at the initial uh, at the entrance of the compressor. So m dot is going to be volumetric flow rate one or specific volume one. Volumetric flow rate is 0.3. A specific volume, I need to read it from the tables. That is V of G at 120 kilopascals. If you read the tables, you will see it's 0.16 to 12. Do the math, and m dot is 0 0.0308 kilograms per second. So I found m dot, no problem. 308, H2 actual is 297.232, minus H1 is 236.97. Our input of the compressor is 1.86 kilowatts. Okay, problem 10. We have a rigid tank containing 1.5 kilogram of water at 120 degrees Celsius and 500 kilopascals. 22 kilojoules of shaft work is done on the system and the final temperature in the tank reaches 95 degrees Celsius. If the entropy change of water is zero and the surroundings are at 15 degrees Celsius, we are asked to find the final pressure in the tank, the amount of heat transfer between the tank and the surroundings, and the entropy generation during this process. Okay, so let's see what we know first. We know that initially our tank is 120 degrees and 500 kilopascals. Finally, the tank, the water inside is 95 degrees Celsius. And because the problem specifically states that the entropy change of water is zero, I know that S2 is equal to S1. So let's start working on part A, the final pressure in the tank. Now, by checking the table, I would see that at state one, we are dealing with a compressed liquid because 500 kilopascals is way higher, higher than the saturation pressure of 120 degrees Celsius. And so S1 will be S of F at 120 degrees Celsius, which is 1.5279 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, I know that this is the same number for S2. So S2 is 1.5279 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. I have to check this number with S of F and S of G for water at 95 degrees Celsius. Now, if I do that using the tables, I would see that S2 is between S of F and S of G at 95 degrees Celsius, 
meaning we are dealing with a saturated mixture. In saturated mixture zones, temperature and pressure are functions of each other. So P2 is going to be saturation pressure at 95 degrees Celsius, which is 84.609 kilopascals. So this is part A. I found the final pressure in the tank. For part B, the amount of heat transfer, we are going to use the first law of thermodynamics. Q net minus W net is delta U. Now, we are looking for Q. So Q is here. We also know that 22 kilojoules of shaft work was introduced to the system. So plus 22 is equal to delta U is mass U2 minus U1. It's 1.5 kilograms of water times U2 minus U1. Now I need to find both U2 and U1. U1 is easy. U1 is U of F at 120 degrees Celsius because state one is compressed liquid and I can just use the tables to read the properties. U1 from the table is 503.6 kilojoules per kilogram. U2 requires a bit more calculations. We figured out that state two is a saturated mixture, so I need to find the quality first. X2 is going to be S2, the number that I have, minus SF over S of FG. Both SF and S of FG are numbers for 95 degrees Celsius. So plug in numbers that I have and reading from the tables, I get that X2 quality is 0 0.045. Now I can use quality to calculate the internal energy at the second state. So U2 is U of F plus X2 U of FG. Again, numbers of U of F and U of FG are from 95 degrees Celsius from the tables. So plug in numbers, 398 plus 0 0.045 times 2,102. And you get that U2 is 492.62 kilojoules per kilogram. Now I can now I have both U1 and U2, I can calculate Q. Okay, plug in numbers, I get Q is 1.5, 492.62 minus 503.6 minus 22. Q is minus 38.47 kilojoules. Now for part C, we are asked to find the entropy generation during this process. Now because the entropy change of the actual water, our system is zero, we are only concerned with the entropy change of the surroundings. So S gen is Q over T zero. Now Q is negative for the system, but it's positive for the surroundings because it's absorbing it. So I have 38.47 over the temperature, absolute temperature of the surroundings is 15 degrees Celsius, which is 288 Kelvin. Do the math and you get that S gen is 0.134 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, problem 11. We have a two-stage compressor. Air enters the compressor at 100 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius, and it is compressed to 900 kilopascals. The pressure ratio across each stage is the same, and the air is cooled to the initial temperature between the two stages. Assuming the compression process to be isentropic, determine the power input for a mass flow rate of 0.02 kilograms per second. And what would be the 
what would the power input be if only one stage of compressor was used. Now, I'm going to draw a very simple schematics here. So a two-stage compressor can be modeled by two separate compressors. So we have compressors one and two. I'm going to show them with C1 and C2 to represent the two stages of the compression. This is the entrance and this is the exit. I'm going to show it with four. The exit of the first stage, let's call it two. The, uh, and the entrance of the second stage, let's call it three. The box in the middle is the cooler because the problem states that the air is cooled down. Okay, so what do we know? Let's list all the things that we know. We know that at state one, air is 100 kilopascals and its temperature is 27 degrees. We know that coolers are constant pressure devices. There is no pressure drop. So P2 is equal to P3. We also know that the temperature at the entrance of the second stage of the compressor is again 27 degrees. And we know that finally, at the exit of the compressor, the final pressure is 900 kilopascals. Okay, so this is everything that we know. We are asked to find the power input for this compressor. So first law of thermodynamics says that the work of the compressor, the power consumption of the compressor, is m dot times delta h of compressor one plus the delta h of compressor two. Expanding this equation, that is m dot times cp t2 minus t1 plus cp t4 minus t3. Now here t1 is known, t3 is known, t2 and t4 both are unknowns. And we need to somehow figure them out. The key here is that the problem specifically states that we are dealing with isentropic processes. So that means delta S is zero throughout the compression process. I'm going to use that. So for ideal gases, I know that delta S is CP natural log of T2 over T1 minus R natural log of P2 over P1. For an isentropic process, that is equal to zero. I do not know what P2 is. The problem instead gives me another piece of information. The problem says that the pressure ratio across each stage is the same. So P2 over P1 is equal to P4 over P3. However, P2 is equal to P3. So this is P4 over P2. I can use this equation. P2 squared is P1 times P4. P2 is the square root of P1 is 100 kilopascals. P4 is 900 kilopascals. So P2 is 300 kilopascals. So I found P2 using that piece of information. T2 is known, P1 is known, T1 is known. I can find T2. If I play with the red equation, I can get T2 over T1 is P2 over P1 to the power of K minus 1 over K where K is the ratio of CP over CV for air, it's 1.4. So plug in everything that I have, and K of 1.4, I get P2 is 410.62 Kelvin. So I found T2. Now I know for the second stage of the compression, Again, delta S is going to be zero. I can use the same equation that I had for the second stage. T4 over T3 is P4 over P3 to the power of K minus 1 over K. So T4 
is going to be again 410 62 Kelvin. Now I have both T2 and T4. I can plug in everything back into my purple equation and calculate the power input. So power input of the compressor is mass flow rate times 1005 410.62 minus 300 plus 1005 410.62 minus 300 and you get our consumption of the compressor is 4.447 kilowatts. Now the problem says, what would the power input be if only one stage of compression was used? Meaning that we had only one compressor. This is state one. And just for the sake of consistency, this is state four. Now again, the compressor will be isentropic. So again, T4 over T1 would be P4 over P1 to the power of K minus one over K. This time P4 over P1, it will be the ratio of 900 over 100. So T4 will be 562.03 Kelvin. Plugging it back into our equation for power consumption, m dot cp t4 minus t1, I get 0 0.02 times 1005, 562.3 minus 300. And the power input of the compressor will be 5.2. 267 kilowatts. Now, by using a two stage compressor and using an intercooler between the two stages, we were able to reduce the work input of our compressor. Okay, our final problem, problem 12. We have a two stage adiabatic turbine. Steam enters at 6 megapascals pressure and 500 degrees Celsius. And the initial mass flow rate is 15 kilograms per second. 10% of the steam is extracted at the end of the first stage at the pressure of 1.2 megapascals. The remainder of the steam is further expanded in the second stage and leaves the turbine at 20 kilopascals. We are asked to find the power output of the turbine, assuming A, the process is reversible, and B, the turbine has an isentropic efficiency of 88%. Okay, so this is a very basic schematic of our problem steam enters at one to the first stage and exits like this state two ten percent of it is bleeding off the rest enters the second stage and is expanded to state three so this is turbine stage one this is turbine stage two Again, let's list all the things that we know. At state one, at the entrance of the turbine, I know pressure is six megapascals and temperature is 500 degrees Celsius. Also, M dot is 15 kilograms per second. At two, the exit of the first state, I know that pressure is 1.2 megapascals. And for part A, I know that S2 is equal to S1. At 3, the exit of the entire turbine stages, I know that the pressure is 20 kilopascals. And again, for part A, S3 is equal to S1. So checking with the tables, I know that I'm dealing with a superheated steam at state 1. 
because T1 is greater than the saturation temperature at 6 megapascals. So we are definitely superheated. So I'm going to read H1 and S1 from the tables. H1 from the superheated tables is 3423.1 kilojoules per kilogram. And S1 is 6.8826 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. State 2, I'm going to check the S2, which is equal to S1, with the SFG of pressure 1.2 megapascals. I will conclude that we are still dealing with superheated. So I can use the superheated tables again. S2 is 6.8826 because it's equal to S1. Now H2, we don't have the exact number for S2 uh, 6.8826, so we need to uh, interpolate. Now if we do that, I get that H2 is 2963.68 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so I have H1, I have H2, now I need to find H3. Now at state 3, S3 is equal to S1, which is 6.8826. Now if I check this S with S of G and S of F at pressure of 20 kilopascals, I would see that S3 is between S of F and S of G. Meaning we are dealing with a saturated mixture. So I need to find the quality. So the quality is going to be S3 minus S of F divided by S of F G. S of F and S of F G at 20 kilopascals. Plug in numbers from the tables, 6.8826 minus 0 0.832 over 7.0752, I get that the quality is 0.855. Now I can use this quality to find H3. So H3 is H of F plus X3 h of f g again plug in numbers from the tables h of f and h of f g from the tables for 20 kilopascals i get that h3 is 2267.517 kilojoules per kilogram now you may ask why am i so interested in h1 h2 and h3 the reason is that based on the first law of thermodynamics, the work output of a turbine is mass flow rate times the delta H across T turbine 1 plus the mass flow rate delta H across turbine 2. Now mass flow rate across the first stage is 15 kilograms per second. So that is 15 times H1 minus H2. I got, I got those numbers. Plus, during the second stage, 10% of uh, the mass flow rate is gone. So we are working with 90% of the mass flow rate. So that is 0.9 times 15. times H2 minus H3. Now let's plug in some numbers. So the power output of the turbine is 15. H1 is 3423.1 minus H2 2963.68. Plus 0.9 
times 15 times H2, 2963.68, minus H3, 2267.517. Now do the math and you would get the power output of the turbine is 16,289.5 kilowatts or about 16.3 megawatts. Now this was part A. We were assuming that both turbines were, I mean, the turbine is isentropic and the entropy, entropy is the same throughout uh, the expansion. Now for part B, we are asked what would the power output be if the turbine had an isentropic efficiency of 88%. Now this is an easy one. Isentropic efficiency of a turbine is the actual power output over the isentropic power output. Now the number we have here, 16.3 megawatts, is the isentropic one because we were assuming that the turbine is ideal and delta s is zero throughout the expansion process so now 88 percent means 0.88 is the actual power output of our turbine over 16.3 megawatts doing the math you get that actual output is 14.35 megawatts Thank you for staying to the end of yet another video. If you find this video helpful, please give it a like as it greatly helps the channel. Also, please consider subscribing for more science and engineering content. Thanks again and see you in another video.